August 11, 2014 regularly scheduled Midland Public School Board meeting. Um, if everyone can turn off their <coughs> phones before we begin. Everyone. <laughs> all right, if you would all stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Okay, President Wasserman is absent this evening. On my phone. He's actually oh, on the I'm phone sorry. with us okay. tonight Surprise. from Colorado, I think. Okay, sorry, Jerry. That's correct. Okay, Vice President Branstad. Here. Secretary Gorton, I'm here. Treasurer Kaminsky. Here. Member Baker. Here. Member McFarland. Here. Member Singer. Here. Everyone's Excellent. here. We're pretty much all here. <coughs> all right, moving on to our consent agenda. We have um, approving the regular meeting minutes from July 14th. We have five resignations. We have a recommendation for employment of a new speech and langu language pathologist. We have approval of some textbooks that were actually um, presented on June 9th for the 28-day period um, examination. We have item 2.5 with some Netgear storage equipment for disaster recovery um, that we hope to purchase. There's some legal invoices for payment and approval of the June 2014 financials. <coughs> Do I have a motion? I move to approve items 2.1 through 2.7 on the consent agenda. Second. All right, <coughs> Pam, supported by Scott. Is there any discussion? All right, if not, I'll take a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 All aye. All opposed? All right, passes seven zero. All right, next up we have requests to address the board. We didn't have any formal requests. Anyone like to address the board? All right, if not, moving on. Um, next up I think is the main focus of our night tonight here, and so I'll give a little introduction before I turn it over to Mike. So. Um, I know for a long time, and I know John and I sat, was it five years ago now, that we were on the school closing committee. Mm -hmm. And at the time, we closed several of our elementary schools, and since then, we've closed Central. And you know, we keep getting asked, what, you know, what's the long-term plan? Do we have a plan? And um, although we've done a lot, we haven't really had a real good uh, long-term plan. So we know we keep getting asked by our community, um, you know, what's, what's the plan? And we know we can't predict out many, many years down the road, but we are at the point where we can probably predict out 15 to 20 years. And we um, have a grasp of our student population. We know that it's probably gonna continue to decline for the next few years, and then it's gonna stabilize. We also know it probably, there's nothing that tells us that we're ever gonna have um, any kind of significant growth. So <coughs> based on all of this, we've started um, a process to understand what our facility needs are and um, what we're gonna need for the long term. So Mike is gonna go um, into more in depth about what our process has been um, and <coughs> give us some broad strokes of our facility needs. And so after tonight's discussion, um, so the public knows we are going to follow this up with further discussion with several um, community committees to help guide us and help us in assessing what our needs are and uh, helping us make some recommendations for what we can do in the future. So our, our real goal is a long-term plan for our district. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike. And I'm gonna start it off to- Jerry, can I say a quick word? Yeah. In excess, a uh, very good summary. Uh, I'd also ask my fellow board members if I was sitting at the table tonight with, uh, with the gavel, uh, to hold off on questions, if you may, until Mike completes his thing. You'll naturally get a lot of questions in your head, and most of them are going to be answered further along. And so, to keep this thing moving, because you'll have tons of them, please uh, hold questions till the end if you can. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I'll start it off tonight, and then uh, in the middle slides, we're going to hand it off to the experts, and then I'll close a little bit again tonight. Um, the slides I'll also let you know is something that we're going to use the next few nights, um, starting tomorrow night in our public presentation. So it's kind of got a dual purpose and you'll see there's some
points for you that you already know, but some points also for the public as we go through and, and try to facilitate the discussion we're going to have. Um, let's go there. You know, I think w the moment I arrived and the moment that you hired me, one of the things that we were dealing with was um, our one of our only ever failed millages we've ever put in front of our citizens. And how do we move forward um, with our facilities at that time, no longer having a sinking fund? And how do we handle uh, maybe technology along along that ride as well? And so, um, you know, in the first 90 days, you guys sent me out to talk to a lot of people. And one of the concerns out there was, is there a good long range plan for Midland Public Schools and their facilities as they're aging and getting older? And um, the five or six closed buildings that we have sitting out there, what are the plans and what are we going to do with that? So, um, as you know, um, over time we developed the idea and the plan that we needed some facility experts to come in and take a look at our facilities um, and study them to provide information, to have an open discussion with our community, no matter how difficult some of those discussions may be as we go forward. So that's the process that we've been working on. Um, our goals today and why we did that is that long range plan and to take our learning environments and make them 21st century capable as we go forward. So those were two of our goals. What we did, um, we went out and we put our FP out for the experts. We uh, contracted with an architect and an engineer firm and so we have uh, French and Associates here tonight, our architect, and we have Bart Mallow, a construction manager, to help on the estimating portion of, of um, what's needed out there in our buildings. And they went out and they visited all of our MPS facilities, those closed, those open. And when I say they visited them, they went through them pretty detailed. I mean, I was on one of the trips where we went into, um, not many people would know, that there's kind of a tunnel where the infrastructure of Midland High School is deep down in the ground and we were down inside looking at um, the sewage systems and the water <coughs> systems and electrical systems that come into Midland High School on the structures and so they did a nice thorough examining of all those buildings that we went out into. We also spent considerable considerable amount of time talking to the users of those buildings and no one knows those buildings better than maybe the administrative team or certainly our building managers who are taking care of those buildings on a regular basis and so they provided great input on um, some of the issues that all of our buildings were, were looking at in, in order for the experts to study that. We also took time as um, you did when you closed some of those buildings to use our, our uh, population study that we do. We update every year and uh, we have an expert take a look at that. Um, and estimate our population going forward. And we know that we're going to bottom out around 7,200 students, so we're still going to go down another five, six, seven hundred 700 students, but it's going to be a slow downward trend, and then we'll bottom out. And, of course, we all hope that that number will rise back up, but there doesn't appear to be any rise in over the next 10 to 15 years. So that 7,200 number works, which means really the facilities, the space that we have right now that we're using is just about right. A difference of five or six hundred students isn't going to drive a major change in our facility use, and so the number of facilities we have out there works. And let's put it, go ahead and put a, uh, to sleep the urban myth that lives forever about our high school situations. And so we made sure we put that bullet point out there that shows you that we're never going to get below the smallest number ever going to be is 150 percent of those two buildings. So unless you're willing to put 150 percent or 50 percent above what Midland High can hold, you're never going to not need Dow High School. And so um, let's put that story away. And, and now that you're down at two middle schools, they're certainly at, um, at capacity right now. So a little getting smaller works fairly well in those buildings since they are at capacity. Our elementaries will see a little decrease over time, but they're nearly those smaller grade levels have moved through. And so they're just about at the grade level they're always going to be going forward over the next 10 to 15 years. Some interesting things we had to consider and some numbers maybe to put out there for people to make them take a look at that. We all know our facilities are aging, but um, I'm not sure we've ever looked at it quite this way. 88% um, of our buildings are 50 year, years old or older. Um, the average age of our MPS buildings are 61 years old. And so as you can imagine, if your um, home was 61 years or older, there's probably some issues coming up in there. Still good facilities, some of them, but some issues in them. 
Some of our facilities have been closed, and when they close and they're shut down, they deteriorate. And those buildings tended to be your, some of our older buildings anyway, so we have some issues there as they deteriorate. Many or most of our uh, buildings are not energy efficient at this time. There's a lot of energy efficiencies that can be gained with modern technology and how we heat um, our buildings as we go forward. Um, as you know, we don't have a sinking fund, have not for the last two years, and so that has caused a problem as far as um, how do we afford basic maintenance of buildings as we go forward. And we can add into that that our general fund is not able to absorb the three to four million dollars your sinking fund was bringing in when we're already spending that amount over what, what our budget is each year. And so we have a shrinking general fund as it is, or shrinking savings as we go forward. Most of the community knows we are not up to grade or we're, we're the modern day standard is for school safety as well. And so from um, Sally Port entrances to video technology to even how we route or control our traffic, since most of our elementary schools were built as neighborhood schools where students rode their bikes to schools, walked to schools, or rode a bus. Today, as we know, a large population um, is delivered to school by their parent, and then we have the bus, the car traffic, and the walking bike traffic mixing into a school that wasn't designed for that. So we have some safety issues there as well. School districts, a little background for you. School districts typically issue bonds to upgrade or renovate facilities. Um, how a bond works is once the bond is issued, um, they would levy a debt millage in order to pay um, those funds back. MPS has not had a debt millage since Dow High Woodcrest was built in the late 1960s. And I'm going to say, and I don't know that it's for sure, but I have, I'm not sure I've ever seen a school district in the state of Michigan that could say they haven't had debt since the 1960s. So we would be one of few that have done a fabulous job over the last 50 years of maintaining your facilities through a sinking fund or general fund. So you've been very responsible to the citizens, but um, at this point, because of the age of the buildings, it, that sinking fund uh, strategy probably would not work because of the status of school funding today. There certainly isn't general funds to cover that. Uh, as you know, um, for 10 years, uh, there was a two mil sinking fund. Um, over that 10 year period, about brought in $43 million, so approximately $4 million a year. Uh, $4 million sounds like a large figure, but if you add that into the square footage, the number of buildings we have, um, it's really like our homes we all hope to do is each year do a project at home, fix something up. That's kind of what was going on. And truly, you were actually the last few years with the age of your buildings of that sinking fund, you were going backwards instead of making gains you were, you were losing. <coughs> and now with the last two years of no sinking funds, we certainly have let some things go out in our buildings that need to be addressed. In May of 2013, um, the renewal of the sinking fund was on the ballot. It did not go through, and there was also a 0 0.9 mil request to keep up with the growth of technology. That's a new, new issue out there that's go going very quickly. The districts are struggling on how to finance going forward as well. And the reason I put this one in there is um, I want to keep you to keep in mind that there was a request for 2.9 mils, and you were certainly paying um, over 2 mils at one point um, just a few, two, few years ago. So at one point you were paying two mils, today you are not. So the last two years you've had a reprieve of paying any of that. And I want you to know what's going on and what's typical in school districts around our state. When I said earlier that I'm not sure there's any district that can say um, they haven't had debt for the last four, 40 plus years, um, there's not many that can say they don't have debt right now. And so our neighboring districts, our county, um, here's a comparison there of the millage rates for each of those. And you can see, uh, you know, it, it varies some, but there's a huge investment there from those other three districts into their facilities. And so that com those communities have made investments into their, their facilities going forward. Other districts surrounding us, um, and th their millage rates, and so I think I've included most of those that you would consider surrounding. Me being fairly new, I may have missed somebody you might want to see there. Um, but th there's the mill rate, millage rates there. <coughs> Again, Midland Public is the only school district <coughs> that does not have a, a debt millage at this point to maintain their facilities. And then we like to compare ourselves to other districts around the state. 
and these are often the districts that we compare ourselves to when we talk about test scores and um, programming and those such things. And so it gives you another example of the millage rates, the investments those school districts are making um, to keep their facilities, 21st century learning facilities, um, energy efficient learning facilities going forward. There's approximately 550 public school districts in the state that can levy debt. Um, Midland is one of 61 that does not have a de debt millage. And we are one of only 29 presently that doesn't have a debt millage or a sinking fund. And so you can see most districts have that. That's a normal practice in order to maintain their facilities, to invest in their facilities going forward. What we'd like you guys to do today when you hear from our experts is um, listen to the facility and provide the feedback. Um, we're going to go into uh, three public meetings over the uh, next two weeks to do that as well. Um, we have a consultant, <coughs> Bonix and Bonix, to help us with that each night. Um, we're we're going to present this information to each of them and then um, have them provide us feedback to try to figure out in a few months um, what we might present to our voters going forward, what might they want to listen to, what might they want to invest into as we go forward um, after you hear the evidence of each of our buildings going. And I think at this point I'm going to introduce Dale Jerome from French and so Associates and Dale will introduce um, or have them introduce the rest of the, the gentlemen that we have here tonight. just want to talk a little bit about um, the purpose of what we were asked to do and the process that we want, went through to do our task. Uh, as you can see here on the slide, basically we were asked to give you an overall assessment of each of your facilities, facilities, both occupied and unoccupied, and make some recommendations as to how you can extend useful life of both your buildings and grounds. Uh, the process that we use, as Mike uh, mentioned a little earlier, is we did literally visit each facility and site, walk through pretty much every uh, nook and cranny, and, as he said, climbed in tunnels and, and on roofs and, and all the parts that many of the public has never seen. Uh, we wanted to see those. Um, it was done with our eyes, and in some cases our ears and uh, noses. Um, and we did also meet with principal and or building manager at every site that we visited. Uh, these are just a listing of some of the people that were involved also. As you can see, we had uh, representatives from both facilities and technology on behalf of the district. And as I mentioned, either building principal and or building manager was a part of every visit. Uh, on our side of the professional team, we had uh, architects like myself, uh, civil engineers, mechanical, electrical engineers, uh, technology experts, and construction experts to help us visit. These are all people who uh, not only have engineering or expertise of a specific type, but are also very familiar with school districts from around the state. Um, just a quick overview of our findings. Uh, overall, as uh, Mike mentioned earlier, um, your buildings are uh, well maintained and for their age they've been very well kept so you've done a great job of protecting the community's investment in facilities and maintaining them over the years and your efforts have done a great job of extending the useful life of the infrastructure mechanical systems boilers in many cases are well beyond what from an industry standard would be considered their useful life. In many cases, you far exceeded those expectancies. Um, I would also say that overall, uh, the sinking fund improvements that you've made in recent past have been good investments. You've gone after the low-hanging fruit and invested in things that will save the district money on the operational side, things such as lighting, for instance. We've invested a lot of money in making changes to lighting to um, save 
the district operational dollars. Um, but in general, much of the infrastructure, things like mechanical systems, boilers, they are either nearing or uh, past their useful life expectancy. And in many cases, part of that also represents the fact that they're not very efficient. Some, as you can imagine, uh, a furnace that we maybe put in a house 20 years ago does not have anywhere near the efficiency of one that we would buy today. Mechanical systems, for instance, in school facilities would be much the same. Um, so you have a lot of um, uh, what I would fairly label as antiquated um, systems in some cases. Um, and overall, I think it's a fair overview, kind of overarching summary to say that you will need to make some investments in your facilities to extend the useful life of them. Uh, just want to highlight some of the areas of concern that we saw as a result. Um, and we have a very detailed listing of all the, what we consider to be needs or uh, improvements that we would recommend to you. Uh, we won't go through that because it's literally thousands of items on a, um, a building by building basis, but um, just want to kind of give you an overview of some of the areas of concern. As has already been mentioned, um, your buildings are not new by most standards. As you can see, uh, the age, maybe the, the lower right corner there of the slide says it best, over 80% 80% of your facilities are 52 years or older. So, um, you know, um, that makes me feel really old right now because I'm more than 52 too. So I guess <laughs> I'm, I'm an aging facility. Um, but they are old. Um, and it's, as I said, they've been well maintained, but there is a point where significant dollars have to start to be made to keep those buildings um, around for the long haul. Um, a couple of buildings in particular that based on their age and condition I would point to as some uh, specific areas of concern. Um, East Lawn, um, while um, it's one of those buildings that, that you walk into and you, you kind of you start to like it because there's some character there and, and some historical uh, sentiment as an architect anyway I start, I start to get but you also have to realize that it was built in 1945 and has some very specific site constraints and its overall age and condition make it um, a building that um, may not have another 50 years left in the tank, to be uh, to put it um, very openly. Also, uh, Northeast Middle School, um, built in 1950, um, there are some issues there with settlement and the exterior brick we're actually recommend, have recommended to do some further testing and analysis there. Nothing that I would point to as, you know, run away from the building and shut it down today, but in the long run, you will need to pay attention to some of the issues at these buildings. So just in overall age and condition of Northeast, and as I said, we've actually made a recommendation to the uh, district to do some crack monitoring so that we can better understand whether it's just age of the brick and the condition that's been that way for a long time and will just stay that way uh, for a long time or whether it is something that we need to pay attention to and make some immediate recommendations as how to take some corrective measures. Um, one other thing that you may um, be familiar with, but at Woodcrest, um, some um, subsurface moisture, basically humidity levels under the slab of that building are higher than what makes it an optimal situation, primarily for maintaining the floor systems that are in that building. Uh, even the new floor systems that you have put down probably won't last as long as they should because there is a moisture problem of some type under the slab. And, and we've since been given some tests that were taken and not to uh, far past, and those give us an indication of how we can take corrective measures. And those measures, those corrective measures, are built into the recommendations and the uh, pricing information, the budgetary uh, recommendations that we're sharing with you this evening. 
Um, another uh, building in particular that I um, want to make mention of um, is Carpenter Elementary. Uh, again, built in 1926. Um, and I know that there have been some um, good investments, again, made to preserve that facility. But overall, it still has some issues. Uh, and from an educational standpoint, things like the original heating system uh, probably need to be dealt with. Uh, it's maybe not the most flexible layout. So as it, you try to transform the building for use of some of the 21st century learning um, that you would want the environment to have in an elementary school, it may not lend itself as well to that type of transformation. Um, and because of its age, it's difficult to make some of the improvements to the building. And overall, it just is on a fairly tight and congested site as well. Another building um, of mention of what we saw is a Central Middle School site, uh, you know, built in 1937. Again, original heating system. You have a lot of buildings that still have steam heat. Um, I've, been, I've been doing um, new facilities, educational facilities, for over 25 years now, and I've never done a building with steam heat. So, and you still have many steam boilers. Again, not the most flexible layout. It worked probably well for what its intended purpose was originally. And some of the um, core areas, like the auditorium being in the dead center of the building, worked well. But to adapt it for future use makes it more challenging. Um, and again, kind of difficult to implement um, newer mechanical systems in a building of this age. Um, just some mention of some other areas, such as um, safety and security. Um, most of your schools were built before the modern day concerns that we have regarding safety and security. Uh, for the most part, for years, schools were and still are built to protect students from a fire. And that presents some challenges for other areas that we now find that we need to students from and that's primarily the concern of an outsider an intruder coming into the building so you have some challenges there as Mike mentioned a lot of your sites were not built um, in a day in an era when every student was dropped off at school by their parent and so traffic flow is, is a concern uh, lighting um, and just simple things such as PA systems and uh, monitoring capabilities um, are not there in many cases or are less than adequate by today's standards. And the bus fleet, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to some of the um, budget um, numbers in a few minutes. Uh, we already mentioned this a little bit, uh, energy efficiency, but as I said, you have a lot of original boilers. Many of them are still steam. Uh, the unit ventilators in the classrooms, in many cases, are original, well past their useful life. So again, applaud you for maintaining them the way they have. But at some point, they do become obsolete and or just the challenge of not being able to find parts anymore. They just don't make them anymore. You still have many uh, pneumatic controls throughout. And pneumatics are run by air. Um, and by today's standard, you can't even buy a unit ventilator with pneumatic controls on it. Everything is digital or electronic in today's world. And not just that change is good because it's good and it's new, but what those digital controls allow you to do is to have much better control and ultimately realize energy savings or um, protect your uh, general fund dollars and operational costs. And another observation, just many of your um, classrooms, doors, uh, windows are still um, old, original single pane glass. Again, not very efficient. Um, in regards to the vacant uh, facilities, the facilities that you closed, um, a couple uh, points there. Um, in general, the cost to repurpose these for even educational purposes is going to be higher than an occupied building. Uh, it's worth noting that after a building has been closed for more than a couple of years, to bring it back into use, you not you cannot 
be grandfathered by many of the existing conditions. You now have to basically bring it up to the standards of a new facility, and so that adds additional cost. Um, for the most part, they're all located within existing neighborhoods or residential areas. So that means that they have fairly limited alternative uses. And, and in most cases, what we see with facilities like <coughs> this is that the most likely value of that facility is really limited to what is the value of the land that the facility sits on. Um, and you'll see that we've projected some cost of what it would cost to um, demolish those facilities if we decide that that's the best um, course of action to take. And just a quick mention there, of um, Central Middle School again, um, recognizing that it is still partially occupied and that there is uh, that um, district use of the Performing Arts Center creates a, a little bit of unique challenge to that one because it's a very large facility that surrounds a fairly small and specific limited use compared to the overall, overall size, age, and condition of that building. Uh, just um, some observations that I would add from what I call the lens of 21st century um, for the most part, at the elementary school, your elementary uh, media centers or library areas are fairly small. In many cases, if you're familiar with some, many of the elementary schools, they just kind of are woven into the fabric of the hallway in many of the elementary schools. And um, unlike when schools, these schools were built, and the majority of the footprint was to house books, and there was areas, isolated areas for individual uh, research or study. Uh, in today's realm, we find that a typical media center would want to ideally have much larger areas for collaborative uh, team uh, activities that can take place outside of the uh, classroom and involve uh, multiple students, in some cases, combined grade levels or combi combined classrooms so you don't have a lot of those what I call collaborative learning opportunities um, outside of your classroom. Also, your um, gymnasiums um, in many cases are fairly small and because of the dual use of both gym class and um, lunch um, time, in many cases you're using those spaces from the very beginning of the day to the very end to get all of the activity that needs to take place within those spaces in a typical school day. And in a newer, more modern facility, we would probably see um, in many cases dual or specifically dedicated spaces for gym and or um, cafeteria and the ability to combine those in in a larger dual use space. Um, and in general, um, I think because of the age and condition of some of the um, unit ventilators in many of the classrooms being original, they don't meet today's standards in terms of ventilation requirements. And so uh, there's an opportunity and a need to consider making the classrooms more healthy environments. Um, technology, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Paul Twig from Bartonello um, was our expert in that area, and I'm going to let him talk specifically regarding those areas. In looking at the technology systems, we looked at both the infrastructure and the back end systems, as well as the equipment and the devices, the computers, projectors, and such that people use. For the most part, your infrastructure and the backend systems are in very good shape. Um, from a cabling standpoint, um, much of it is in good shape, but you do have some original cabling, you have some first generation cabling from when you first brought computers and labs into the district, some areas that need to be addressed. Your network and wireless system is as good as any district throughout the state that I've seen, but as you see with the TV commercials where they, a few years ago they talked about 3G smartphones and then 4G smartphones, you know that speeds always get faster. So as we're considering this 10 to 15 year uh, plan for the district, at some point that equipment will um, become 
your bottleneck and as either uh, students or staff or for, uh, bring in devices, they're going to expect it to run a little bit uh, faster. So at, at some point in that window, you're going to need to do a refresh. The, you currently lease your printers and copiers. When you had the sinking fund, it, it wasn't possible to buy that equipment. But if you are considering something like a bond proposal, you have the opportunity to use the bond dollars to purchase that equipment. This is an area where you could um, where you could leverage some of the bond dollars in order to free up some of those general fund dollars that Mike was saying are so precious. And those are the dollars that can go right back into the classroom since you went into classroom instruction. So you do have an opportunity there as you look at your printers and your copiers to maybe consider purchasing and maintaining instead of From a, a classroom technology standpoint, again, you have very good equipment that's in, it's in the hands of the teachers and students now. With some of your ongoing initiatives that you have, whether it's um, online learning, whether it's the online testing requirements that are coming from the state, whether it's your initiatives for doing blended learning, are going to require some more classroom technology. Um, it, it might be, and, and here we're not just talking about computers or devices, we're also talking about tools like the projectors and stuff that are used. And lastly, I've mentioned this throughout, that um, as with everything that we're considering in these assessments, if we're looking at it over that you know, 10 to 15 year window, there are a number of the technology systems that the state looks at it from having a useful life of five to 10 years. So there are some pieces that if you look at it, um, e even if it's in great shape now, at some point in that window, you're gonna need to refresh it to make sure that it's keeping up with the current standards today. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff, who will be giving you an overview of some of the cost summaries. Thanks, Paul. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Jeff Atkins with the Bart Mello Company. I'm the director of our pre-construction services for K-12 projects. Um, so we'll kind of give you a cost summary report of everything you've heard today, um, kind of a comprehensive list of everything we've looked at throughout the whole process and how we kind of divided things up into different categories. Um, so how the estimate was developed, um, again, Dale mentioned we walked through all the buildings, um, we met with the different people involved there. Um, what we do is we draw upon historical data. Um, we do a lot of these estimates for a lot of different school districts. So we have a very good baseline of where schools are at. We always check that against bids that are actually done on the project to understand where they are. We also we need to understand that you know the market today is shifting. Um, there's more work out there. Pricing is going up, so we need to make sure that we're, we're keep, um, keeping track of that to make sure that the pricing we're giving you is accurate today's dollars, and then we start to talk about escalation factors with that estimate. Um, and also the level of detail on the estimate. Again, we mentioned there's thousands of lines of estimate detail here, and at some point we'll give you that full report to look at and digest. Um, but right now, this is looked at more as a conceptual level of a budget. You know, we haven't done any design work yet, so we haven't gone that far in the process, but we do have very good numbers of cost per square foot and other um, benchmark numbers that we use to develop these estimates to give you a, an order of magnitude of what this whole project would cost. And then with that, we're looking at this again as a comprehensive thing. We try to break it up into a couple different categories that you can look at and decide what options we may want to consider or further investigate on those processes. And those buckets that we kind of developed for this project here, um, the first bucket, the biggest bucket of the whole thing is your facility needs. Um, this is a comprehensive district-wide look at all the needs we consider. Um, we kind of look at equity across the district to make sure that what one building has, every building has to match that same standard so that there's not a have or have not situation within the district. Um, the second bucket we looked at would be elementary renovations. Dale mentioned the enhancements, looking for that 21st century lens. We thought that was a nice standalone bucket to evaluate. Um, the vacant buildings, that's a separate item, doesn't really impact all the other school buildings, but it is something to consider. Um, the central middle school campus, what could be done there? We've got a couple of different options, um, different pricing points for that project, and then bus replacement as a category. So first, the district facility needs, as I mentioned, it's the biggest bucket of it. Um, it is a big price tag for that amount of work. Um, the reason we put a range on there is because we know we can definitely scale back the project. Um, you can always look at what you do or don't want to do, but when you look at a building, you wouldn't want to do just part of the windows in the building. You're going to want to do all the windows. You wouldn't want to do just half the unit ventilators. You want to do all of them. Um, but on a high end, we want to consider some escalation in there. So we've kind of got a range that this falls in for the overall project. Um, and again, to kind of recap, you know, we we'll looked at it in terms of structure needs. Life safety is definitely one thing we've made sure to include, and also equity, as I mentioned. So kind of 
digging a little deeper into that facility needs, um, here's a couple of the key components that are in there. Uh, the safety and security um, was all included within that, um, that 93 to 99 um, million dollar range. And again, a lot of these safety features are everything that Dale's already talked about. Um, it includes all your architectural building components. In most cases, these are all one for one components. These are all things you can kind of relate right to your house. You know, after 30, 40 years, your windows, you probably replace them. Um, doors, you always watch these home HGTV, home makeover shows. Buildings get old, they get tired. You've got old wood cabinets still in your building that um, are great. They got some arch nice architectural flair, but they're failing and they need to be replaced. So all the different one for one type replacements within the building um, we've looked at in this category. Next is the mechanical electrical. Um, again, these things don't last forever. And I used the house analogy before. This is more like your car. Um, you can't really continue to upgrade your car over and over again to keep it running. Um, if you do, you're really a diehard at that kind of stuff. Um, but your motors do fail. You can do your oil changes. You've done those things. You've maintained those. You've got your 250,000 miles out of these, this car. Um, but you need to replace the equipment now. So it's very cost prohibitive to continue to replace that. We looked at the exterior work is included in this. This is your stuff as far as your parking lots, the things that the parents see on the outside of the building. Um, there's some drainage issues out there. Also your athletic facility needs are included in the exterior work. Um, and then furniture, equipment, technology stuff that you just heard from Paul, all that's included within that initial, what we consider your facility needs. The next bucket we looked at was your elementary school enhancements. And this we pegged at a range between 18 to 20 million dollars. And again, the range here is because we haven't designed anything yet. We've got ideas of how much square footage a new gymnasium takes, and we've got a dollar per square foot of what that gymnasium may be. But until we plop that on the drawings and start doing some detailed designs, we need to figure out what that actually will cost us. So, but we feel very comfortable it's going to fall within this range. Um, and each one of those additions to the elementary schools would be slightly different depending on the actual site logistics. Um, Five-year buildings would be very similar. Two of them might be a little bit different. We've kind of run different scenarios on those, and we've put together the, the budgets for those. Um, the next bucket of money would be your vacant buildings. Um, the range here being nothing. You obviously don't have to touch them if you don't want to. But if you did want to um, take down your five currently vacant buildings, it would be in the $2 million range. And you can obviously do anything in between that range. Um, but these buildings would have a very high cost per square foot to upgrade them. Um, after three years, it's like you've heard, they can't be grandfathered in anymore. So um, we haven't done a thermal analysis of that. That would take a lot more detailed information with the fire marshal to decide exactly what it would take to bring these up facilities up to code. But we do know it would probably be in the range of a 25 to 30 percent increase over what just remodeling an existing um, currently in use building. bucket here is that central campus. We kind of clumped the carpenter and East Lawn into that, knowing that geographically they're all kind of in the same area. Um, and also age-wise, they all kind of sit, fit in that same uh, age-wise. So we decided to look at that, um, you know, holistically to say what, what could be done there? What do we want to look at as different options and scenarios that we may want to evaluate um, depending on what the community feels on those things. Um, so we've got a range, a kind of a wide range between three and a half to $13 million options. Again, we'll kind of delve into a couple of those specific options. We can kind of tweak those options as we look at those. But again, as I said, because of their age and condition, we thought it would be good to really dive into these a little bit more detail than the other facilities we had. So looking at that, um, here are those three options for that central campus. Um, we've included within that initial 93 to $99 million number, there's $11.5 million to renovate uh, East Lawn and Carpenter. Um, to keep it up with the district standards and the other facilities in there. So kind of keep that as your benchmark. That's already in the initial number. What we did look, though, is that with that central, um, what if we demoed the two classroom wings of the building and then renovated the performing arts center part of the building? What would that cost? Is that a worthwhile investment um, for the taxpayers? And that would add about $3.5 million to this program. The second option we looked at is we just, you know, we always talk about what ifs. What ifs, what ifs, we want to throw those all out on the table at this point. We said, what if we renovated the two classroom wings at Central, kept that building, um, you know, reconfigured that for elementary use instead of middle school use, um, and then didn't do any work at East Lawn or Carpenter? What would that cost? 
Um, and that would be a net $5 million ad. And again, the reason it's only a little bit of an ad is because we've already got to $11.5 million in the budget. So um, in total, it's going to be you know a $16.5 million investment. Um, but you're going to make $11.5 million of that in East Lawn and Carpenter regardless. So um, we thought, what would be the premium for that part of the investment? And then the third scenario we looked at, again, we just kind of go around the table there, is you know, what would it really cost if we um, took East Lawn and Carpenter offline and built a new elementary school at that campus? Um, and that's where you're going to get a $13 million plus for that. Obviously, a new elementary school doesn't cost $13 million. It's a lot more than that, but the 13 plus the 11 and a half, that gives you to a, a target number with you. The next bucket, the bus replacement, um, two to six million dollars, um, and this really just varies. We know exactly what a bus is going to cost to replace, and it just might depends on how long you'd want to extend a bond program out, how many buses you want to replace, and it's just a simple mathematical formula. Six million dollars probably replaces um, nearly your entire fleet. Um, typically, you're going to want to probably just phase those bus replacement out um, only a few per year, so that once the end of the bond program comes, your general fund can absorb that and replace them on a sporadic basis. You don't want to go in there and replace 50 buses all in one shot. It would just become a create a burden down the road for something to replace 50 buses. So here's just some facts. I think this is one of the best slides we've actually got on the buses, even though it's not in the wheelhouse of our construction guys. But um, you kind of see some numbers on the buses. The buses are are old. It's an aging thing. It's just the reality of life. We want to keep safe buses on the roads and keep them maintained. Um, you know, 200,000 miles is a lot of miles for a bus, but um, these things are built well. And very quick overview on all the numbers. Um, again, we've got a lot of that information in the reports we'll give to you as we go through the um, more phases of this project to kind of get into the nitty gritty of what's included and all that, but we want to give you the big picture of what, what's in those things. So here's a recap of what we've just talked about. Again, the district-wide facilities, that's just the needs, so the one-to-one -one replacement, some of these security upgrades, that's in the 93 to $99 million range. The elementary additions, improvements to create a multi-purpose spaces, um, improve your media centers. That's in the 18 to 20 million dollar range. Um, take out your vacant buildings, and this would be, you know, abating any uh, hazardous materials in there, taking the building down, and restoring it to a greenfield once it's done, so that it could be repurposed uh, or sold to somebody. Uh, the central campus, so three different options, kind of range between three and a half to 13 million dollars, and then the bus replacement, just based on the number of buses you want to replace over time, is two to six. So, let's see what that totals up. So we left a lot of options and a lot of different things there. I'm not trying to um, come to a conclusion, but to start a discussion. And so there's lots of discussion to be had in, in there, as you're welcoming to go through. Um, and that discussion is going to start tomorrow, like I said er earlier. Um, we're going to have three uh, public sessions. Tomorrow we're going to call up a group that we have coming in, our community leaders, our uh, business leaders in town. And then um, the, next, the following week, we have a parent group coming in to make sure we represent them. And then we have um, a MPS employee and former employee group. Um, we have board members mixed in there as well, going through those public groups to gather input. Can't do it with everybody because we really want to gather input. But on top of that, um, we, w we have that talk to us button on our web page if you haven't. I've been on there to see that, and we're hoping that all citizens who are listening or interested um, can pose questions, thoughts, ideas onto, us, onto our website on that Talk to Us button, and we'll respond with information from there as well. Um, and again, that we are in discussion mode. The plan is that um, we will take that period for, to gather information. The board will take that information, and the seven of you get to get get to work and go down and figure out just what all this means, what is the community willing to support, with the hopes of presenting something to our community in February 2015 to address those facilities um, for the next 10 to 15 years. And we have some urgent needs out there and some things we have to do to go forward. There's just no way to maintain those aging facilities where we are. <coughs> um, this slide here that we have up here, uh, we, we kind of thought we'd place it this way. In 1960s, there was another generation of people sitting in, the, in some room here deciding um, where the district's going to be from 1960 going forward for many, many years. And 
they went out and they built Dow High, Jefferson High, and Woodcrest Elementary, buildings that have lasted for over 40 years now and will live be, will need to be refurbished in order to extend their life, but will certainly extend their <coughs> life going forward. So they set the district in a great position going forward um, to make our community the healthy community it is. And so um, we, we need to do the same thing as we go forward. Some benefits of doing that, and we've talked multiple times tonight about general fund and some relief to that general fund during these trying times. So this is a side benefit of doing that. Energy efficiency is probably, um, besides salary and benefits, our largest line item. And so right now we are not an energy efficient school district. Um, uh, we've done many small projects to try to be more ener energy efficient, but when, again, uh, East Lawn has its original boiler that's been converted um, multiple times it's not very energy efficient and we have uh, single pane glass and um, old units running in the buildings and so we're not very energy efficient we have very little control over our HVAC systems and so the more control we have and the more energy opportunities we have there that money is forever saved each year forever going forward it's a big piece of what we should be looking at and doing the opportunity to have fewer buildings all buildings cost us money even those closed ones cost us some um, and certainly um, one, of the, one of the thoughts or ideas was up there was to go from seven elementaries to six. And so losing two of your oldest inefficient building and having a efficient building, uh, you have efficiency going forward. So another general fund possible release go, relief going forward. Technology replacement, meaning um, the, for the next so many years, technology would be moved out of your general fund and covered by the bond funds. General fund gets relief during that time period. That's another fairly large item we're trying to keep up with technology. Busing replacement, large item, five to seven buses a year, usually built in, a budget, in the budget that would move out temporarily basis um, going forward. Maintenance relief, certainly if you have newer equipment, we spend a lot of maintenance, and a lot of time on older HVAC systems and boiler systems that need to be brought up and working. Um, not only the energy efficiency and the, the part changing and all that, but then go back to the control, the time to be able to control that from a device at home um, for our energy going forward. Extending life of our present buildings, and so we'd save our taxpayers down the road. If we don't do anything to some of those buildings, it's like an older car. If you don't maintain that car, you're going to pay for it down the road by a shorter life of your car. Um, we're at a point where many of our buildings, we don't put money into it. It's going to shorten the life. Northeast being one that really stands out. We don't do something there. Its life is relatively short. Um, improve safety and security for all the staff or students. We, that's a major issue in our country today. Uh, we cannot address some of those by just um, how we do procedures. Our buildings have to change in order to address them appropriately. You know, we attract families to our community. You know, a healthy community is often defined by its school system. You know, I'm, I'm one of those that came here for a reason. Um, it, it was defined by your school system, and it is a wonderful, attractive community right now. Um, where we're heading, without some relief, without some change in our facilities, I'm not sure we'll continue to be attractive to the community. And so we're at a kind of a, a fork in the road, you know, to make some decisions here going forward. Programming is one of the things that families come to expect here. We have a, a diversity of program that meets all kids' needs at nearly every level. There's no doubt where we are at that fork of the road. Um, programming may become less with some wrong decisions going forward. And so it's going to be very difficult to continue to provide that without some changes in what we're doing. So if we don't do those things, we could see diminished quality of life in our midland communities. Um, buildings would age and deteriorate. We'd become less attractive as a school district, shorter life of buildings. Um, we'd fall behind in technology, so we're trying to give our students every advantage in this 21st century world. We wouldn't be able to provide that going forward. Um, extended walk zones and eliminate athletic busing. We already know that last year we took seven budgets, buses out of our budget because we couldn't afford them, even though they were built in there. And so if we continue to do that, we have less buses, we'll bus less students. And the only way to do that is extend those zones. That's not good, that's not safe for our community. Um, athletic busing will be an issue um, as, as well going forward. Um, future generations would need to build new buildings. So you know, if we don't look at doing something now, 
ten, and we prolong that 10 to 15 years, 10 to 15 years, they're not looking at maybe a elementary, they're looking at a middle school elementary, maybe another elementary going forward. And so we have some issues that you just don't want to keep kicking the bucket down the road on. So tomorrow night, or in the next few nights, we're gonna ask these people some of these key questions, you know, do you share any of these concerns that we have? This, are those real concerns to you? Um, you know, what are some obstacles you see out there? You know, obviously, anytime you're asking people to tax themselves, that's an obstacle, and are they willing to do that, and, and what dollar amount are they willing to do that at? Um, just to show, so you know, and looking at that, because of our industrial property wealth, in this community um, that keeps your millage rate fairly low to bring a large dollar amount in. Um, we estimate, and these are only estimates, that um, the range you saw tonight would be around two mils and could be as high as 2.9 depending on what you fix to do going forward over a 12 to 15 year period. So that millage rate, you saw all those other school districts millage rates, you, there was only one or two maybe below that rate. You'd still be one of the lowest millage rates in the state in, in certainly our area, so it's not something unusual there again to ask for. We're, we're lucky because of our industry doing that for us. One mill is equivalent to about one dollar for every thousand dollars. You can do the math at home, figure out you know what your housing value is and what that approximate cost you. We're not giving more specific details yet because we don't want to drive that. Do we know where we're going on those pieces until we um, get further down the road and, and actually come out and begin to say to the our community, this is what we're going to present to you in February. So what's next? Three meetings, gather input, and the board will sit down, make a tough decision on what to present to the voters in February. If we make that decision early fall, then we have some work to do to go out and educate our community. That's when the real work begins to happen. questions at this point and uh, I'm sure you have quite a few <coughs> who would like to start questions comments Jessica. I, I think that uh, this my only comment is thanks uh, Mike for your eyes to in years to go through the community and take a look and survey the public I think it's, it's definitely the right time to take a look at long-term uh, plan for our, our facilities We've got a lot of square footage out there and we've got a fairly good idea where our population is going and I think that the, the public seeing the effort being a part of the effort and also addressing that that need as we go forward I think that's it's really good and I'm really surprised at how rare it is for us as a district not to be in that list of that majority of districts that do have some form of debt that's invested in the so that's really that's really eye-opening um, that and uh, the benefits of giving some relief to the general fund is very appealing, and I, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to uh, um, make more use of those general fund dollars more into the classroom. Um, when I hear what we're looking at, I think safety is a major concern, and it's nice to see that we're looking down the road, and that is a priority. We need to make our schools a safe place uh, for our students, and we need to be attractive for families that are here and to, for families to come. And that's why our family came to Midland, and I'm sure that's why a lot of families came here. So if we could continue to create a district that families are excited to be a part of is a priority. It'll be interesting to hear our community's response. And I can, you know, and to just think about the opportunity cost if you do one and not the other you know where what will we come to for a decision and it will be a hard decision but I like having the community involved in that <clears throat> do we have any students that are also included we have talked about doing that we haven't done that yet at this point in time but in the fall we did think about maybe meeting with some polls and more of the high school because obviously they're of age to have that input Anyone else? Has there been any estimates on um, annual savings that we could recoup versus the expenditures to get those savings? 
I would say just internally we've done that. You know, um, you know, Gary could tell you right now what his technology budget is and how much that would save. He has said that. Uh, I can't recall off the top of my head right now, but Gary has mentioned that it would be about this much. In the I imagine somebody will ask that question. Yes, we'll have all that okay. for, for it going forward. We, um, we didn't want to drive too much of, of that tonight. You know, again, we're laying this out to the community, and we don't want to be the ones driving. So, so we're very, very careful. About it. We could, I could easily choose and figure out what makes sense up there, but that's not what we're trying to do right. here. I was thinking the late 60s must have been an exciting time. The student population was growing by leaps and bounds, and they actually built three schools. Wouldn't that have been something? And of course, now we're on the other side of that, and things are going down. But uh, it's, I think it's like, like you say, we, you know, you just you can't really just keep moving things farther down the road. It's not like we have the option of not doing things. It's just a matter of what and when. You know? I think it's a great point. You know, we we have decreased, and so like they had to build schools. We have to make tough decisions on what to do with those empty mm -hmm. buildings mm -hmm. and repurposing um, you've done with a couple <coughs> they were it was viable and you found purposes for those we haven't been able to you know find purposes on some of those others and so and that's sh we're not saying that all of those should be gone it's a decision which ones and we want just to have the cost for all of those to have that discussion in there One thing I think about with historical buildings, too, is I know when I was on Notre Dame's campus, they talked about um, updates to, to their buildings and how it would be so much cheaper for them to build a new, uh, but they wanted to, to maintain the historical building, but it ended up costing 100 times more to do that. So you look at some of our buildings, too, and I'm, I'm sure um, some will, will want to save those for the historical means, but then you look at the cost of doing that and when we're trying to um, uh, spend money wisely in the community and keep all the students best interests in mind um, we'll have to keep that in mind as well. Yeah, that really came through in looking at the auditorium we know we need an auditorium going forward and it has um, as Dale would say our, a lot of architectural design a lot of promises going there but then you get the problem around it mm -hmm. and so that really can't be fixed and so the, the the plans we kind of showed there is that desire to keep the present auditorium in some capacity and not have to build an auditorium going forward. And so th that was part of the issue in there. And then, of course, we know Carpenter and what it means. And, um, and not to say it's one that should come down, but it certainly is one probably putting dollars in at this point. That you can't change the inside of the way it's structured for today's standards. I just want to thank you for doing this too. It's amazing to be able to look at the beginnings and just touching a little bit on this list. And when you say there's a thousand points, it was just mind boggling. But as, as all of us, I'm sure, have gone into different communities and seen different schools, old, new, and everything in between, it's become apparent even to me that we need to, we need to update, whether it be the security and the entrances or what they call in some places cafetoriums and the media centers where they have these group learning spaces. Um, our buildings are far behind on that and I think if we want to meet the needs of our students and moving forward, you know, this is something very important for us to do as a community. So I hope everyone will, that has something to say, will take advantage of this opportunity to be included in, in hearing and letting your voice be heard. Jerry is still out there. Yeah, Jerry. Yeah, I, I was waiting for everybody else to get done um, before I chimed in, but I guess this is the time. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for getting us to this point, and this is just the very first step in a journey. It will be a relatively quick journey because of our need uh, to become fairly inclusive. You know, we talked about our forefathers looking, you know, 50 years ago, what was needed, and did a nice job of laying out a footprint that lasted for, frankly, a half a century. That's a long time. Uh, I think it's now it's our job to lay out the next wave of the future. And I'm not going to be um, naive enough to believe that I know or any of us know what 50 years will look like from now, but we certainly know what 15 will look like with a fair degree of certainty with our student population. And uh, what I think our commitment should be is to make sure we provide that generation of students a good 21st century learning experience and environment and leave our successors the flexibility that this plan will have the flexibility that they will need 
uh, 15 and 20 years from now as, as the world changes even faster than it did in the last half century. Just that we're certainly not done. This is a start. Right. A starting point, and we'll have discussions with our community and lots of work to do over the next two months, and we'll certainly be reporting our progress out as we go. So, yeah, I mean, I think I just want to summarize again that a lot of this, I mean, the whole beginnings of this were one that we keep being questioned over and over again. What is our long-term plan here in this community ever since we started closing buildings? You know, Mike, when he came, one of the first things he noticed because sometimes it does take an outsider to come in we get used to what we see and I know you know my family travels to a lot of different school districts so we did see we start to know and then like you all said the people that run our buildings have done a phenomenal job of keeping them up I mean I go into schools and I, I notice some of the things like ooh, this bathroom looks really out of date but to the general public they don't see the inside workings and they don't see the day-to-day -day. they don't know the day-to-day -day struggle that some of the people have in the district keeping things running and so I think that this is really good information for everyone in the community to um, to understand what we're dealing with that we do have some very very old systems in these buildings and we have done a very very good job for a long time in maintaining them but we're kind of to the end and we're to the point where we need to really start making some decisions so I really encourage everyone like everyone else has said please you know, let, let your voice be heard. Tell us what you think about this. Do your homework. Look into this data because um, that's what we really want is we really want the community to start talking to us and saying, yes, I've seen that or, wow, I haven't seen that. Can I see that? You know, can I see what you're talking about in the schools? Because um, I know on our uh, FFO committee, we did get a chance to visit some of these different schools and go into the depth of East Lawn underneath the back parking lot <laughs> and see the old buried coal bin and up you know high and down high upstairs to see some of the things and things that other people don't see and that's when you start to realize wow you know yeah I think it's time that we have this discussion with the community so uh, please everyone let your voice be heard so thank you all for coming out tonight too all right hey, Angela yes. I'm going to drop off now okay thank you for calling in thank you everybody should I turn him off here, or will he just disconnect? I think he'll disconnect. Okay. All right. Moving on, we have next. We have item 5.1, which is an operating millage renewal resolution and proposal. So I'll let you give a little background, and then. Yep. Last month we uh, approved the actual ballot language for that renewal. It's standard practice to renew in order for us to get our full student aid funding. You do it in Midland, it's in your practice to do that once every 10 years. That 10 years is coming up, and so it, that will be in the on the November ballot as renewal. So in order for us to get our full foundation allowance from the state of Michigan, this is one you have to approve in order for that to be given to us. Tonight is the resolution part of it that you'll be approving. All right. So you're oh, well, actually, you are in luck it does not. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually am just looking for a motion on this. I would move to approve the resolution of the operating millage renewal proposal as presented that will appear on the November 4th, 2014 ballot. A complete copy of the resolution ballot language shall be attached to the original of these minutes. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. All right. So moved by Pam, seconded by Lynn. Is there any discussion on this? All right, then all in favor say aye. 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 <coughs> all opposed? All right, so it passes 6 0. All right, moving on, we have finance. Oh. We have um, the FFO study committee minutes. Do A very short one. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, we met August 6. Uh, myself, Ms. Brandstad, Mr. Wasserman, Mr. Charles, Mr. Cooper were present. Also in attendance were representatives from Barton Mallow and French Associates. Uh, the FFO committee met with representatives from those organizations. Um, we, they had been reviewing MPS buildings in order to put some estimated costs in these for our facilities, which was the topic of our uh, report that was presented tonight. Next meeting uh, date is uh, to be determined. All right, thank you. Moving on, Bob, would you like to yep, handle 6.2? Uh, for information, first, I have three gifts totaling $8,935. 
first shift is for $2,475 to Midland High by the Midland County Youth Action Council. Uh, and that's for Midland High's kickoff transition program. Uh, I have another gift for $1,960 to East Lawn Elementary. That was by the Midland Kiwanis Foundation. That's for some summer camp fees for East Lawn students. And the last gift for information is $4,500 to Chestnut Hill. That's from the Chestnut Hill PTO, and that was for classroom magazines and library books. I do have one item that requires your action tonight, so require a vote. It's a gift totaling $8,721. Uh, that's to Woodcrest Elementary. It's from the uh, Woodcrest PTO, and it's for laptop computers. All right, do I have a motion for that? So move to accept uh, the gift from Woodcrest PTO for laptop computers for the amount of $8,721. Support. All right, so moved by Lynn, supported by John. Any discussion? Yay. All right. Oh, yeah, I agree. Very thank you, generous. Thank you very much for the donors. Yes, Definitely. It's, it's amazing. We're in the middle of the summer, and we're still just amazed by the amount of donate donations that we get. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> All right. Passes 6-0. All right, other than that, we just have um, item seven, correspondence to and from the Board of Education. Item eight lists um, the rest of our meetings for the year and some tentative meetings um, starting in 2015. And at this time, we will move into our study discussion. And uh, we'll start with Scott tonight. Um, not much to discuss <coughs> other than what we kind of hashed out after the presentation. Thank you to all of our presenters. Um, that was very eye-opening and it's very informative uh, to give our public what they need to make an informed decision. Um, you guys really did a good job and I, this is going to be a lot of evolution for our district and hopefully uh, we take it the right direction. So thank you for your effort. Um, beyond that, it was kind of everything else. I would echo thanks for coming and for all your hard work. and. Uh, I look at, I know it's going to be challenging, but at the same time, I think it's kind of exciting to, to see our schools taking that, that new road into the 21st century and uh, what opportunities it will bring after we get it all taken care of in the years to come. I see that our MPS, um, our schools flyer has come, so I'd like to thank everybody that contributes to that. It is a wealth of information, and I encourage our, our public to read <coughs> it. Um, lots of interesting information on what goes on in our school. Uh, summer is fleeting, uh, but I'm, there's activity going on already. I see high school parking lots full and kids coming in and out of gyms and fields. So uh, you know it's around the corner, but enjoy what's left of it. And I notice that you know, we've got some new staff at different buildings, and so we welcome them because I know that they're probably already in the classrooms or the offices getting things going. So. That's all. All right, thank you. Yvonne? Well, I just want to say thank you, too, to our presenters. Um, your presentation I thought was very good. It was very easy to understand. It was very complete and thorough, so it really gives us a lot to think about. And thank you, Mike, for leading all that. I know that's a lot of work. Um, and to all our uh, the faithful who donate all the time, thank you so much. Those gifts really mean a lot to our students. And. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Just hope everybody enjoys the rest of their summer. Very good. Oh, and by the time we come back again, school will have started, right? Correct. So I hope everybody gets off to a real good start. Absolutely. Yeah, I saw people, kids buying backpacks this week. So <laughs> <laughs> now it's close. Thank you. I look forward to uh, this the next couple weeks and really listening in and what the community is going to say and uh, hearing hearing what they say and uh, moving forward on our our future plans for building. Uh, I'm excited about football season. It's right around the corner. It's my favorite season. So uh, I love the marching band and I love the football teams and the community that's brought together at those, at those games. So looking forward to that. And uh, who knows, maybe someday we'll have new turf out there and uh, it'll look even better. So um, what else? Uh, your Monday communique, you had asked uh, us to take a survey and I got on and took a survey about STEM and I thought that was neat that our community not only Midland 
Bay City, Mount Pleasant, um, all our surrounding communities are looking to see what, what we think about uh, STEM and where we want to go with STEM and um, just uh, opportunity again to give input. So uh, I thank you for that. And that's all I have. Okay, last but not least. Um, just my one item is just regarding the election coming up in November. I know we just got over the primaries, and uh, it's uh, slowly be gearing up towards November election. But I think by now most of you know that I won't be rerunning for my seat on the board. Um, and you know, I I went and uh, conferred with many of the MPS stakeholders, looking at uh, you know, what was best for me, but also best for the board of education. I probably spent majority of that time making that decision on how the board would look go going forward and I felt that it was in good hands with having a lot of experience carrying over um, and it's been said on this board is that it's actually harder to make the decision not to run than it is to make the decision to run and I struggled with that a lot um, but as many of you know I serve on the state board of optometry appointed by the governor and the majority of that board's term is up and they are not going to be coming back and so that leaves a board uh, with very little experience, and I'm an experienced person with just two to three years on that board. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of in a in a difficult position where you got two boards that have critical organizational needs and critical moments uh, for those organizations. Um, with the state board of optometry, uh, we have almost an all new board coming in, uh, but we're doing a major overhaul of policy and regulatory um, work uh, for the uh, optometry as a profession in the in the state of Michigan which the Attorney General Office assists us in looking at all the previous laws and things for the past five years, so we have to update the books there. Um, optometrists are now becoming board certified, so we have to figure out how is the profession going to use that that, sh that terminology on their shingle, if you will. And also this uh, thing called the Internet is really affecting how uh, patient care is being uh, implemented and also prescriptions and so forth. But. Um, but the thing that I looked out first and foremost is where was I needed the most? And so I'm still going to be serving in a public capacity. Um, but I would, uh, the thing that mattered the most is having a lot of the experience and making sure that this board, I know you got a lot of tough things going on coming up here in the next uh, 12 to 18 months. And if, if I didn't feel that that was, um, you know, having good continuity to the leadership, I, I probably would have made a different decision. But I think you guys are going to do well. But I'm just really torn, difficult decision. So. Well, we thank you yep. very much for yep. your years of service. Thank you. Oh, do you want me to go or you go? No, oh, go ahead. All right. So first of all, Mike, I would like to thank you for starting out your thing, putting to rest once again that <laughs> Dow High <laughs> is not closing. As a Dow High parent, I still hear that uh, five years later <laughs> after cool. that, you know, initial list of all kinds of potential configurations of the district and that was the one that people really grabbed onto so thank you very much for once again making that statement um, yeah just once again to encourage people use the talk to us button on the MPS website tell us what you thought tonight um, of this um, I, I too loved the our schools um, I liked how the bus schedules were by each school. That made it much simpler for me this year <laughs> to figure out what bus numbers my children will be on. Um, I, I know I have not taken the STEM survey yet, but I noticed that. I very much encourage people to do it. STEM is near and dear to my heart as an engineer myself. And um, in my new job, I am um, in the process of looking to hire people. And, I, and there is a need in this area for people with STEM degrees. So very much encourage us to continue pursuing um, that to encourage our students to at least investigate those as options and uh, not decide not to before they've had a chance to investigate that. Um, yep, I know school is right around the corner. I know um, this week begins uh, sports practices, officially I should say. Um, I think today was football and Wednesday is everything else. and. Um, I know we have orientations coming up. Once again, something that was fabulous in the art school's brochure. It, you could go to your school and see when your orientation was. That made it very um, easy this year. So I think that was all. Well, once again, thank you so much for coming out. We uh, visited with um, Barton Mello and French and Associates last Wednesday, too, and um, just a great job going through in detail all our facilities, and I very much appreciate it. So I'll turn it over to you, Mike.
and I'm going to start with the talk to us button as well. And, and just to give you a little feedback how that's been going, we get two to three every single night. Excellent. And so it's been used quite a bit. Uh, in fact, I talked to uh, the folks behind it today, and they said it's one of the busier ones that they've seen so far. Mm -hmm. So it's gone very well, and we hope that continues to grow. Most of them have been fairly easy to answer, and so hopefully <laughs> they'll stay easy questions <laughs> to answer as we go forward. Um, and again, I'm going to repeat the dates on the facility study groups that are going forward. So tomorrow evening, um, we have community leaders and retired board education members. Monday, August 18th, parents. And Wednesday, August 20th, current MPS employees, retired MPS administrators. Um, summer food service program. It's something we've wanted for a while. And this summer, we were able to qualify to have those. We have a uh, feeding center at Midland Curlings, at the Midland Curling Center in the Carpenter School. Um, tenants been so-so. Uh, we'll continue to work and try to grow that, but let's continue <coughs> to try to get those words, that word out, and um, at the end of the summer we'll give you a report of just how many meals we were able to serve uh, going through. As yeah, some of you may have read or saw that Michigan Tech received a $5 million um, grant from our, our um, very uh, gracious Herbert H. and Grace A. Dow Foundation and Midland, Midland Public Schools was a partner there. Uh, Mr. Bruton attended a, a couple of the meetings on the request, and we're going to be one of the pilot schools for that restructuring um, of middle school science is what the money was for. So talk, speaking of STEM, it was mm -hmm. going forward. Um, we also reported out in the last few communiques our IB and our AP results, and I want to give a hand to our high school students and certainly our high school staff for the outstanding the job they, they have done. Those results um, were quite impress impressive and continue to be so as we go forward. Um, the, our kids outperform, you know, other school districts other uh, in other states and other countries, so they're doing a great job on those very rigorous exams. Um, Franklin Center, so one of the buildings that we're talking about, we did find maybe a temporary use for that. It was approached by Rob Valentine from Dow Chemical in their um, support of FIRST Robotics, which we were moving FIRST Robotics to Central as well, and they would like more space. They'd like to grow their program. I think uh, Midland High is going to be adding their own team, and so we'll have two teams versus one combined team going forward. Um, we have our middle school programs and our elementary Lego programs as well. I know John's a sponsor on one of those and uh, need, need as much space as possible, but yet we weren't able to incur any cost. We were trying to prevent that, and so Dow has graciously stepped in and given the grant to First Robotics for the utilities of that building, and so they'll self-clean, um, utilities will be paid for. We'll still maintain the grounds, which we would have been doing if it was closed building or not. And so we were able to make use of that, at least temporarily, and we'll see where that goes going down the road. Our we filled them in on the facility studies and where we may be going all, all along on that so they know where we stand as well. What a great opportunity though for us. And since we will not be meeting until after the start of school, remember Monday, August 25th at 1130, we have new teacher orientation here, so please uh, join us if you can. And Tuesday, August 26th is our opening day breakfast, 8 to 9 at Central Auditorium. So join us again if you can. The last one I want to close with, maybe it ties into the uh, bond uh, issue as well, to, is the explanation of cash flow. And so for years, you've had a very healthy fund balance, and that healthy fund balance carries you through the September period where you do not receive a school aid payment from, from the state. So you have to have cash flow to cover that period. Many school districts are already in the position where they don't, and what generally happens is um, school districts borrow for that period and then use their, their October state aid payment um, to repay. So it's a short borrowing period. Um, we were close this year. We've been tracking it, knowing we were close. And yes, there's still a fund balance there, but it tells you how much cash we need each month to carry us through. Um, and there is no doubt that next September we'll be in a borrowing period. So we estimate those costs, at least at present day, and it's about $4,000. It's not huge, but it's not a good thing to be in either to have to be in borrowing. So that protection of that general fund is a reality. I guess that's where it ties into maybe our, some of our thoughts going forward. But I certainly want to educate you and our citizens on um, where we'll be next September. 
and that, that is in inevitable and will be in a rallying period for cash flow. That's all I have. All right. Way to end on a high note. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Does anyone else have anything? All right. Meeting adjourned.